Welcome to Broadmoor Community Church, a church that believes so strongly no matter who you are or where you might have been or where you might be going, you are welcome here. You are welcome, welcome into God's love. I'm Reverend Ann Cubbage, the senior pastor at this amazing place. And if you are ever in Colorado Springs, I would love to get to know you. We're at 315 Lake Avenue in Colorado Springs. Our worship services are at 10 o'clock. We are currently wearing masks and trying to social distance as Omicron is ravaging our hospital systems. But we would love to have you here. We have several activities that are um, planned throughout the weeks on a regular basis. And if you would like to know more about those, they are on the slides that will run just at the end of the worship service. You, our online congregation, are an important part of who we are. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your presence. And thank you for your generosity. If you would like to give to the ministries of this church, please know that we would love to be able to thank you in person or by letter. You can do that by text 719-309-4498. You can do it on our website. You can do it by mailing in a check. You can do it by bringing a check in. We are also in the middle of a capital campaign. Our capital campaign is in order to make our sanctuary space and our upstairs floor more accessible to all people because we do live into our saying, no matter who you are or where you are, you're welcome here. If you would like to give to those, you can give in the same ways. Please know that God is with you wherever you find yourself. And we are so pleased that you are a part of us. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, we seek your guidance. We come in need of direction and encouragement. 
for the life of faith can be challenging. Spirit of the living God, equip us for faithfulness. Empower us to discern true kingdom values and inspire us to embody the gospel this very day. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this space today and always in our lives. Oftentimes, we focus on ourselves rather than on you, but we aspire to be better in our walk with you. Remember and redirect our ways, we pray, as we ask for your spirit to dwell among us, leading each one on our journey. For your blessings, we pray. Amen. who feels that they are a child of God to join me virtually on the chancel steps today. I was thinking about the scripture that we're going to hear in just a few minutes where Jesus actually asks his disciples to do some really, really difficult things. And I was wondering if you in your homes or where you are, wanted to think about some of those difficult things. For example, sometimes when your brother or sister acts up and you get in trouble for it, it's really hard to forgive him or her, and it's really hard to be nice to them the next time you see them. And yet, we live by love. It's really hard when you just got a spanking or maybe got sent to the corner to not be mad at your parents. And yet, they love you and they want to make sure things are going right for you. It's hard to do the things that Jesus asks us to do. And so what I think of is this. We all have superheroes. Mine happens to be Wonder Woman. I don't wear the costume, but I love my cape. So I want you to think about the fact that God is in you and the things that you want to do. Sometimes you need to consider that God will give you the strength to do those things that are so very difficult because we're all superheroes. Let's pray. God, I give you thanks for this day. I give you thanks for all of the superheroes around us. And I ask that you help us remember you are with us. And you will make us superheroes if we but listen. We love you, God, and we know you love us. 
And all God's children said, Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. His divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus he has given us, through these things, his precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. For this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness and goodness with knowledge and knowledge with self-control 
and self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness, and godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with love. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? God, we ask you to open our hearts and our minds that we might hear your word, that we might know what your values truly are and make them our own. In your name, amen. I need to confess something to you all. I have squandered a significant portion of my life trying to be cool. And in spite of this mostly cool facade that you see in front of you, I have in large part failed. I knew even at a very young age that I wasn't cool, that I just didn't have whatever mysterious gene the cool kids had. I knew I didn't fit in with that crowd, but still I wanted, desired, and valued not only being accepted, but esteemed by my peers. And I valued this so highly that I made figuring out the formula to coolness my mission. Cool kids, at least the cool girls, were almost always very thin, approaching 0% body fat. So I lost weight. I dieted, I exercised intensely until I looked just like they did. The cool kids all had nice clothes, often brand new, so I begged my parents for as many of the latest fashions as we could afford. There were some things I just couldn't do anything about, though. Like my name. Elizabeth was not a cool name, not like Brandy or Marcy. I was furious when I discovered that my parents had almost named me Allison, Allison, but had chosen Elizabeth instead. Even more of a problem, though, was my last name, Swineheart. Swineheart was not only not cool, but it was a virtual lightning rod for teasing from inventive young kids. I swapped that name out as soon as I could by getting married at the age of 22. Like I said, I have wasted a lot of time and energy valuing and pursuing the elusive quality of coolness, a fact that honestly, I am truly embarrassed by. Even more troubling to me is that at times, I have valued coolness more highly than other spiritual and godly qualities. Despite a deep knowledge that there are numerous characteristics God values more highly than coolness, over and over again, I have gotten off track and allowed myself to become very distracted by a desire to be cool. Over and over, my values have needed a reset. Well, my story might have made you laugh and you probably chuckled at my vapidness. My guess is that my story likely resonates with you, at least on some level. We all have our things, don't we? Our somewhat questionable values and pursuits that trip us up and get us heading in the wrong direction. Like, we know we ought to give more money to the church or to those in need, for example, but instead, we spend it on a bigger house or more clothes or a flashier car. 
We know our relationships with our spouse and our kids and our friends, and especially with God, are of the highest value in life. But time for those relationships gets pushed to the very fringes of our lives. As we work and we work and we work, hoping that more money in our bank accounts and better stuff will give us the peace that we so desperately seek. We know we should be more like Christ, patient and kind and good, but we find it so hard to behave well when we are absolutely exhausted from the pursuit of the American dream, from pursuing achievement itself in the form of the next degree or promotion. Our values are frequently in need of a serious reset. Why is it so difficult to keep our minds and hearts set on what God values? Just what does it mean to be guided by God's spirit anyway? How can we know that our values are God's and that we are on the right track? Let's begin by defining just what we mean when we talk about values. One definition defines values as a person's principles or standards of behavior, one's judgment of what is important in life. Sometimes when we talk about values, I think we get very heady and intellectual and we begin to tangle our definition with that of belief. While our values can be internal and abstract in one sense, they become concrete as they are played out by our actions in the real tangible world. For example, we may say over and over that we value the truth, but if we consistently lie and cheat, our actions reveal what our values truly are. If we claim to value kindness, yet we consistently treat those around us harshly, we must question whether we value kindness at all. To add to our working definition, I would say that values are not simply moral precepts or standards of behavior we profess to believe, but precepts or standards that guide and shape what we do and how we act. I think this is a biblical definition of values as well. If we return to our scripture passage from 2 Peter, the list of values begins with the internal value of faith and knowledge, but adds onto those values things like self-control, godliness, mutual affection, and love. These values shape our external actions, the ways we behave in the world towards others. Similarly, the list of virtues, often called the fruit of the spirit, in Galatians chapter 5, contains external action-oriented traits like kindness, generosity, and gentleness. Jesus did not just talk about an intellectual belief in God or preach about love, but Jesus instead allowed his relationship with God to direct his actions as he lifted up the oppressed, little children, women, the least in society, as he healed the sick and raised the dead, as he ultimately gave up his life out of love for humanity. Our values are revealed in striking clarity by our behaviors. Resetting our values if they have gotten off track is not an optional extracurricular assignment, dear ones. In Galatians, Paul writes, quote, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Paul challenges, if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. If we have been born anew in Christ, then we are called to make God's values 
our values as well. In the book of Romans, Paul uses the shocking language of slavery, saying, once we were slaves to sin, but now we are enslaved to God, to righteousness, to God's values. While resetting our individual values is absolutely necessary and admirable, the Christian life is not designed to be a solo pursuit. Our character is shaped and formed in community. Reflecting on and resetting our corporate values is a group project. So challenging and uncomfortable as it may be, I believe we are called to look at our communal values and to be open to a reset. What is it that our church values? How clearly are we living those values out? I'll give you just a couple of challenge points, okay? Broadmoor Community Church believes deeply, as we say each week, that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I wonder if we truly mean that completely and unreservedly, however. Would we live out that welcome regardless of an individual's skin color or ethnicity, their sexual orientation or gender preference, or their economic status? Would we still welcome those who didn't act like or look like or believe like we do? Will we welcome others even when it makes us uncomfortable or inconvenienced? It's a hard question, friends. Broadmoor Community Church also says that we value growing the church and bringing in families with young children in expanding our offerings for our youth. Yet it is a struggle for me to find volunteers to lead Sunday school or to mentor youth to make visible the values that we claim to profess. How might God be calling us to reset our values so that our behaviors align more closely with the values we claim to hold so dear? If this all sounds like a lot of hard work, know that there is good news for us. The author of 2 Peter writes that God's own power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Everything. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is at work within us. Yes, challenging us at times, it's true, but working within us, strengthening us and supporting us as we repent and reset our values growing us to ensure that we are not ineffective and unfruitful in our faith. May we have the courage to allow God's spirit to examine both our personal and collective values and perform a holy reset. Amen.
Sometimes I come into this deserted sanctuary. When it's a little warmer, I go outside and I find a quiet place alone in order for my thoughts and my prayers to be focused. So I invite you to find a quiet place alone. Set aside a place in your home if you haven't already. Light a candle. Do something that creates that space of holy. We're going to pray silently for a few minutes, and then we will hear a pastoral prayer, and we will finish with the Lord's Prayer, and the words will be on your screen. Let us pray. Holy God, sometimes it is difficult to figure out what we stand for, to figure out what truly is our core value or set of values. Because we act one way and then we say something else. Help us to live with integrity. Help us to be the people you created us to be and help us to live your values of love and compassion, of forgiveness, of gentleness, of kindness. Holy God, we come to you this day knowing that it is only through your love that we can continue to love others. We are so concerned about those that we hear in the midst of violence, in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of loss. We hear about tsunamis. We hear about war. We see the ravages of fire. We know, some of us firsthand, the trials of job losses, of losses of loved ones. We bring all of that to you. And we ask you to fill us once again with the knowledge of your love, the knowledge of your strength, the knowledge of your call to do justice, to love kindness. And God, we ask that we can humbly walk with you. We love you, God. And we pray the prayer that your son, the one that we follow, the one whose footsteps are sometimes so difficult, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now, may you go out into the world in peace, love, and joy, knowing that you are loved by God, that you have been given everything you need for life and godliness. Amen.